Hello, I'm David Scranton, and thank you for clicking this video. I'm here with Jeff Small, president of Arbor Financial Services. As usual, Jeff, it's always great to talk with you. Great to see you, Dave. Glad to be here. And today's special guest, Harry Dent. Harry's the editor of Economy and Markets, which is a newsletter, and it's available for free at harrydent.com. Harry, great to have you with us again, as usual. Yeah, nice to be back, David. Harry, just to keep continuing our conversations ongoing saga, the markets, it's a spooky time calendar-wise, but the markets certainly are, are, are not acting spooky. With earnings up over 27% year over year and projected 2022 stock earnings to be 9.3% over this year, give us your best bull or bear thesis going forward. Tell us what you think. Well, you know, this, uh, you talk about spooky markets. The spookiest markets are ones that go up super fast, vertical. So we had that 95 to 2000 for five years on almost vertical movement with almost no corrections. And we had it in 87 for three years, you know, from 84 to 87, straight up. And those things are always followed by big crashes because markets just cannot sustain bull moves like that. And even if there's some good things happening, good things don't sustain for that long either. So I my my problem with this, it's already pretty clear from every forecast I looked at. Yeah, we had a big rebound because of massive, I mean, trillions of dollars of stimulus, the greatest one and a half year surge in stimulus ever, counting fiscal and monetary, way bigger than anything before. And now, just a year and a half into the recovery, the economy's rolling over. GDP forecast keep getting revised down. The Federal Reserve, the Atlanta Federal Reserve just put out their forecast is GDP is quickly moving down to 1.2%. So if you stimulate this much and, and, and you only get a short move and the economy starts to weaken again, it shows that the economy's weak under underneath. So, so the worst thing could happen to be uh, stocks bubbling up like there's no tomorrow because they've been doing it so long and the economy being very clear that this means you can have a straight down market in the next year. So my forecast for 2022, straight down, maybe the biggest one year crash we've seen in our lifetime, more than 87, more than 2000, you know, the first of that last big tech crash. Sure. So Harry, I guess my question then is what do you, you know, what triggers it? Because just a, a revised lower GDP estimate doesn't seem to be doing anything. The market participants seem to have blindfolds on. So usually there's that one trigger that starts to spook the markets and then starts that downward slide that then just snowballs. So What's your best guess as to maybe the, the top two possibilities for the things that spook the markets to start the slide? Well, you know, a part of it, I think if they, they just get, you got to remember, most corrections get started by the smart money. These are the people that love that the, they make money off the dumb money, which is most right. investors. OK, so they like to steer a market up. And when they think everybody they look at what everybody's done, when they think that everybody's piled into this. And I'm telling you, everybody is piled into this. And, you know, consumer sentiment, investment sentiment, everything's at the top, 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 whereas, again, the economy is already showing clear signs of weakening, doesn't matter. So they're all in. When these guys see this, they just start shorting it aggressively. And that's all it takes. Now, the thing is, when you're in a bubble like this, and this is why this is so important, it doesn't necessarily take a big thing. What happened when the Japan bubble burst in late 89? I, I used to ask people, what went wrong in Japan in late 89 that caused a 62% crash to come in the next few years? And the answer was, there was nothing. They just had a bubble so stretched that it finally Ooh. started to weaken and then it builds momentum on it. And, and so I don't think it takes some big news event. All I can tell you is the first crash, when a bubble finally has its first crash, it is 40 to 50% in two to three months. And my model is saying this one's going to be even worse. 53 to 56% in two and a half months is what we're likely yeah. to see. So all it takes That's, is this to weaken enough. And then yeah. and then the traders just say, oh, this is over. And then and it just goes. So it's not going to take, I don't think it's going to take a big trigger. Harry, listen, we know the Fed has overstimulated the markets. I mean, the economy, seven train of stimulus from last year is craziness. They're left with really bad choices going forward as the new addiction is stimulus for the economy to grow. But hypothetically, let's have some fun. Harry, if you were Jerome Powell, what would you do right now at the Fed? 
Well, see, see, here's the problem. They're already trapped. When you stimulate an economy this long, you're getting an economy that should have shaken out, worked off a lot of bad. There's 22% zombie companies, technically de- bankrupt, but they, they don't have to default when there's easy money and low interest rates and no recession. And, and, uh, and debt levels that, that are now a lot higher than they were already at the highest in history back at the 2007 top when that recession came in. When, when you just keep stimulating, then it takes exponentially more stimulus to keep a dead economy going. So if they just flatten here, whatever they do here, just taper. This thing is not going to be able to support itself. And the stocks are going to start going down. The economy start weakening and they'll have to goose it up again. The problem is they've dug their own grave here. I think this thing is going to crash either either after one more run into year end or, or, or in, in, in the first quarter or it may just keep crashing here. But once it gets momentum, they're not going to be able to control it. And the way it happens, real simple, that first crash, 40 to 50 percent, you get a rebound when they do finally have a chance to react and do something stimulative again, but with a lot less credibility time. And then you get a two year plus grind down in stocks. Every major bubble burst has had that first dramatic crash, sharp rebound, and then a grinding downturn when people realize no they're so harry harry i'll take that answer is nobody wants to be jerome powell right now nobody wants that job because <laughs> if i was him i'd fake a heart attack and, and, and go disappear somewhere <laughs> okay well i'm sorry i asked you what you would do then okay so so okay so you think it's a quick 50 percent drop uh, next year and then a slow grind down after that so uh, at least a slow grind down is more manageable. People can pick sectors and, and try to get the right sectors that might have a better shot of doing well. But that precipitous drop is the scary part. But still, how far down do you see it going ultimately before all this shakes out maybe two or three years down the road? Well, I, 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 okay. First target, that first crash is pretty darn clear. The support in 2008 at best, about 2192 and my models say 2100. So 20, actually 2000. So 2000 to 2200 is a good place for that first crash to happen. And that's right in that 50% crash range. Yep. And then you, you, you get a bounce just from it being oversold. I think what's going to happen here, which is going to be a bit unique, after this much stimulus for this long, and after they went 4.7 trillion versus in, in a year and a half versus 3.6 over nine years before that, this much stimulus and it fails, they, they, the, the Fed is going to lose credibility here. People are going to realize what's obvious to me, anybody with common sense, you can't run an economy on, on printing money out of thin air forever and expect, I mean, if there's just a short term crisis, then it should just take a year like, like, you know, in 2009, a year of printing a trillion dollars. By the way, I would have approved that level of stimulus. Just get the economy so it doesn't have to just default unnecessarily and just melt down for no good reason. But you do need to restructure debt if you're going to go forward. They never did that. So so the next downturn should take us down. My target is of down about 80 to 85 percent, down to about 600 to 1,000 on the S&P. So first target, 2,000, 2,200, bounce up maybe back toward back towards, you know, 2,800, something like that. And then you see that grind down to 600 to 1,000. And that should be over by late 2023, be my best guess. Wow, Harry. Well, uh, that gets us down to the lows in the middle of the financial crisis. I think we were 600 and something on the S&P. So, yeah. well, I, you know. Go back to 2009 lows. (laughs) I know, I know. So all I can tell you is, you know, those that is those are some spooky Halloween facts, and uh, I know you're not doing it just because it's Halloween. And I think you're on to something in some ways. I hope you're wrong for the greater good, but I can't say that you are. But I look forward to having you back after the first of the year, and let's see how it's going. Harry, Jeff, thank you both for being back with us. Thanks for joining us today as we talk about financial scams and particularly those scams that target older Americans in or near retirement. And unfortunately, yes, this issue has intensified since the pandemic. But don't worry, because we're here today to help you identify and hopefully avoid a lot of these scams. So first, I want to bring in Jeff Small, president of Arbor Financial Services, a retirement income store in Melbourne, Florida. Uh, Jeff, as usual, great to talk with you today. Great to be here, Dave. 
And of course, this is our great opportunity to introduce today's special guest, and that's Dr. Mark Faber. He's an economist and the publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom newsletter. Mark, thanks again for being back with us here on the Income Generation. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Mark, I've got a special treat for us. Um, I've got your gloom, doom, and boom report right here from, from October. And I'm, I'm admiring the, the very first title. It says, how can we expect favorable outcomes from economic interventions, et cetera, et cetera. However, how can we expect continued economic outcomes to benefit, let's say, our viewers and our listeners without Federal Reserve intervention and the expansion of the Fed's money supply and debt? Are we codependent on that now? Well, uh, asset markets, as you know, are by and large expensive. Stocks relative to GDP are very high. The price to sales ratio is very high. And uh, bonds are very expensive. And since you just talked about scams, I want to give you just one scam that is and should be obvious to every investor. At the present time, inflation is running by official statements at 5.4% per annum, okay? Private service, they say inflation is running at between 5 and 10% per annum. In other words, the cost of living of individual households is rising by more than 5% per annum. But the yield on the 10 years treasury is around 1.6%. The yield on deposits is next to nothing. When I have a three months deposit, I get 0.3% annual basis. So what we have is a rate of inflation of cost of living increases that is far higher than the return that you get from your investments in bonds and cash. This is expropriation. This is a scam. This is incorrect. And it will lead not to less inflation, but to more inflation. I can tell you, I lived through- So that, that means, Mark, what you're saying then is, is that we're gonna have a collapse at some point because we're codependent on the money supply expansion and the Fed's quantitative easing. Is that what you're telling us? Well, we will have a collapse in asset markets at some point. I wouldn't be able to tell you whether it's tomorrow in three weeks, I can only tell you that at the present time, the American stock market is driven by only very few stocks that are rising and driving the indices higher, and that the typical stock isn't going up much. But as I said, it is a fraud. It is defrauding Americans who don't understand that what they get on their money in the bank and in treasury bonds is much inferior to the cost of living increases. In other words, if they keep their money in a 10 years treasury for the next 10 years, their purchasing power will have diminished very significantly. Mm -hmm. There's no question about this. These policies by the Federal Reserve are leading to an impoverishment of the majority of Americans, as simple as that. So, so Mark, do you think, you know, we say scam, and of course the result is it essentially acts as a scam for conservative investors. I get that. But do you think there is any ill intention on behalf of the central banks, uh, whereby they're intentionally trying to keep these rates down, just because they want to keep the cost of their own debt down. So is there any intended scam or is it just an inconsequential scam in your, your best opinion? As I said, it is intended to bankrupt the majority of Americans. The pandemic, the reaction to the pandemic and the artificially low interest rates are beneficial to wealthy people, to asset holders. 
such as myself, I'm making these remarks as a socially responsible person, as a historian economist who has studied the political history, economic history. I can tell you this will lead to a disaster. The rich people are becoming richer and the poor people are impoverished. Yeah. There's no question about this. Yeah. Wait, just curious, uh, getting off topic just a bit, of course, one of the ways now that the Democrats are trying to solve the problem is by taxing wealth for extremely affluent individuals, uh, taxing unrealized gains for the first time. But that's, that's not the, the answer either, is it? <coughs> I want to tell you something about wealth taxes. Most countries have abandoned them because the cost of collecting them mm. is much higher than what they were able to collect. If you have a few billion dollars or a hundred billion, <laughs> like some people have nowadays, do you think you can't afford to pay a few million dollars to the best lawyers around right. the world to protect you from taxation. The yeah. wealthy people will, we have statistics whether the tax rate was very high or very low. Mm -hmm. As a percent of the economy, the wealthy people have never paid much more than 18% of GDP. Uh, always some great words of wisdom as usual, Dr. Farber. Thanks so much for being with us here on The Income Generation. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks for clicking this video, because today we're talking about personal finance and the good habits to establish before you head into retirement. And I'm here with Jeff Small, president of Arbor Financial Services, as well as Jim Rogers, the chairman of Rogers Holdings and Beelin Trust Incorporated. Gentlemen, great to have you both back on the show, as usual. I am delighted to be here. I'm in Singapore in quarantine. And Singapore in quarantine. Well, I know you're in Singapore. I'm sorry to hear you're in quarantine, Jim. We're kind of all in quarantine, though, in general with this virus. However, we're talking about personal finance today. And I know you studied philosophy. What is your personal philosophy when it comes to managing money? Buy low and sell high. <laughs> That's a pretty easy one. You can give us... <laughs> oh, I know it sounds easy, David, but it is not easy. It is, sounds so easy and it sounds so wonderful. And you see people on TV and you say, I could do that. I could have bought Apple. Ha. The problem is knowing what is low and what is high. That's the very difficult part. My, I have learned over the years to try to find things that are ignored and that are cheap because people ignore them, but where there's a positive change taking place. If you can find something cheap where there's change, good change taking place, you might make a lot of money. So buying incorrectly, you say, could be the biggest mistake when it comes to personal finances. And the average investor really doesn't know when to buy, do they, Jim? The average investor should not do anything until he or she knows a lot about something. Don't listen to hot tips. Everybody wants a hot tip, David. Everybody wants to be rich this week. Avoid hot tips and wait until you yourself know a lot about something and then do some more research and then buy and then call me because that's how you get rich. Well, the average investor is generally trying to get rich, Jim. And so I think that that focus really undermines the potential to be successful in retirement or to achieve the retirement goals, don't you think? If you want to listen to hot tips and jump in and out all the time, you're never going to be successful and you're never going to be rich and you're going to be working the rest of your life. So, Jim, I'm confused. Jim, I thought you made your investment decisions by reading the stuff on Reddit. I mean, that's not that's not how you make buy sell decisions. I don't know how else to do it then. I watch David Scranton. I love it. I love it. There you go. That's good. That's good advice. And I, I appreciate the uh, the pitch. You know, you said last time we had spoken to you in June um, that it's bad to be young today. And I know you're talking about the national debt and what we're doing as a country. And I want to talk about that with you in the next segment. But do you think even as an investor, it's harder for young people today 
to buy low and sell high than maybe when we were growing up because of all the computerized trading and how manipulated values are? Well, you can always find something that's cheap. I mean, Russia is cheap right now. Commodities are cheap right now. There are, there's always something that's cheap if you do your research and look around. And not, certainly the United States stock market's at an all-time high. That's not cheap. Property is in a bubble in many places. Bonds are in a bubble. But many stocks are still cheap. I guess I figure when we were growing up, it was more buy and hold. You did your analysis. You could be sure it's undervalued. You buy and hold. Today, things seem so manipulated that it's, it's just, it's got to be a little bit harder for the younger generation, it seems. But David, I mean, silver is down 60% from its all-time high. Yeah. That might be cheap. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah. sugar is down 70% from its all-time high. That's not a bubble. It might be cheap. So, Jim, Jeff here. Hey, listen, China is starting to slow down. And so I think the markets globally over there have underestimated the scale of growth on a potential slowdown. Do you think that's going to happen in the United States with all the stimulus that we've had that we're underestimating the scale of potential slowdown when the stimulus ends? Well, we've had the longest bull market in American history. In fact, one of the longest bull markets in any history. So it's going to end someday. Maybe the slowdown in China is one of the early signs that the world is going to go into, going to have problems someday. I own Chinese shares. I have not sold any yet, but I certainly notice what's happening. I know that the Chinese central bank is not printing a lot of money like a lot of banks were, like, like, were like they and like a lot of people were. So maybe we're getting closer to that. I know we're getting closer to the end. I don't know that this is the end, though, Jeffrey. Well, that's very interesting because I've heard a lot of very interesting commentary recently about how to reevaluate the market. But when you look at things like the Buffett indicator or the CAPE index, they're off the charts, Jim. I mean, they just seem completely unrealistic. How can the market march higher from here? Well, next year's earnings beat 2021's in the United States, I guess, is the ultimate question. You are exactly right that all of the signs are there. We've seen this movie before. With stocks in areas where normally and historically they should be sold, and maybe they should be. But, Jeffrey, what I suspect is that if they start going down, the Federal Reserve, the central bank, is going to panic and print even more money. And so there's going to be one more move up. Now, I'm not good market timing, but I would suspect that the Fed, because they want to keep their jobs, are going to keep this going as long as they can. It's going to end. It's certainly going to end within the next year or two. Maybe you should sell because I'm not selling yet. <laughs> I love that advice. That's great. Yeah, I have, a, I have a friend actually who's a financial advisor, believe it or not. He says the same thing. He says, you want to make money, just buy when I sell, just sell when I buy. It's, it's that easy. So, Jim, you know, if somebody wants to stay in the game and they want to stay in the stock market um, because interest rates are low, where would you advise them today to look to do it in a way where maybe they're a little bit more protected? Protected. Uh, you tell me how to put I've, I've never used that word in the investment world. There's no sense. Especially in the stock market. I know. I know. Is that an oxymoron, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> so, but what, where, where would you tell them right now then maybe for the best opportunities that might have the longest positive run ahead versus places where you think the run, you know, the gig could be up? Well, the places that I can see, the only places I see that are cheap, as I said before, are commodities. Uh, you can look at p commodity producers or you can buy commodity ETFs. You don't have to buy futures. That's the best place. I can tell you that Russia is cheap. I suspect most of your viewers are not going to think about buying Russia. I've been buying Russia because it's very cheap. It's hated. Nobody likes Russia. So there are places but they are getting fewer and far, far, further between. And if you don't want to worry about market timing, you know, everything Jeffrey says is right. Everything is at all time highs and at very, very high levels, evaluation levels. And historically, this is the time to sell. Yeah, I guess if you're gonna be, if you're gonna be in the domestic markets, I guess you gotta have one figure on the trigger. You gotta watch it closely because you certainly don't want to get caught in a downdraft. So, Jim Rogers, thanks once again for being with us here. Thank you. My pleasure. And if you enjoyed this video, 
Please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more interviews with top names in the financial industry.